Now it's okay? Yes, yes. I don't know yeah. why it doesn't. Huh? It's fine. Okay. So you see, yeah, so you see my, uh, my slide. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm going to explain uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon which I call emergence. Uh, well, the the word uh, emergence the word emergence uh, is used in many contexts. Uh, I, I'm going to explain what I mean uh, by emergence in this context. Okay, so the reason uh, the reason I uh, the the my reason that is how I arrived to this uh, subject. Uh, I write from metric geometry, uh, as you probably well know, it is probably well known that uh, uh, if you take a Riemannian manifold, uh, you can transform it into a length metric space. Uh, and the first problem was to recover the Riemannian uh, structure from the metric space structure. And uh, uh, this uh, was a very uh, uh, fruitful uh, research subject because uh, uh, for this, Alexandrov introduced uh, his uh, famous uh, metric uh, notion of curvature. Uh, and then uh, in 1998, Nikolaev proved the, uh, the Alexandrov conjecture. Uh, in general, uh, meaning uh, what what uh, Nikolaev proved is that if you have the met a metric space with uh, such that uh, it Alexandrov curvature is in some sense in a metric sense smooth, then it co it comes from. Uh, from a uh, Riemannian manifold, which uh, uh, whose structure you can reconstruct. Uh, but uh, this was a little bit before uh, the solution uh, of the problem from Riemannian manifolds. Uh, Gromov asked uh, for the same, uh, but not for uh, Riemannian, but for sub Riemannian manifold. Well, <clears throat> a sub Riemannian manifold uh, is. Uh, uh, like a Riemannian manifold, only that uh, you can measure lengths only in uh, some directions which are called horizontal. So you have uh, uh, a manifold, on it you have a distribution, D that is in any tangent space, you have a subspace of the tangent space given. Uh, and this distribution is uh, completely non-integrable. That means that you can arrive, uh, suppose that the manifold is connected. You can arrive uh, from, a point, from any point A to any point B by going along the curves which are tangent to this uh, distribution. And again, by Hovrino theorem, you get a metric space. Uh, the distance is called carnot karat theodori distance. And the question was to reconstruct, uh, Gromov's question was to reconstruct uh, uh, this uh, differential structure from the metric data. Um, okay, so Riemannian spaces, I don't know, uh, please, uh, please interrupt me at any moment if, uh, you, if you have questions. Uh, I don't know uh, uh, if you know about South Riemannian spaces, uh, they are very weird. Well, excuse me, space. excuse me, I have one question. Uh, yes. What is the definition of subramanian? Okay, uh, I, I, uh, I put it here. Uh, is this one. But I can, let me, let me stop the screen sharing and let me uh, write on. Uh, okay, I'm going to write on paper. You see my... You see my paper now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have a you have a manifold, and uh, you are not concerned about its topological properties. You are going, for example, let's say it's connected, mm -hmm. uh, topologically. 
and uh, for any point uh, in the manifold you give uh, a subspace of the tangent space and this is called the distribution and on the distribution you define a matrix so you can it, it's enough to give the the normal case you have a metric uh, on uh, the, on the distribution and now if you go from a point a to a point b the distribution is completely uh, non-integrable if you can go from a to b by a path which is everywhere tangent to the distribution you see uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this kind of uh, of things appear ev everywhere for example uh, if you have a contact manifold that means that you give a, a form uh, on it and uh, D uh, will be the kernel of, uh, of the form. And it's completely non-integrable if, uh, uh, if the form is not closed. For example, and other examples are uh, groups. You take G a group and uh, you take uh, again it's connected and you are interested in what happens near the uh, neutral element and then uh, you take uh, the Lie algebra uh, which is the you identify the tangent space at the identity and you take d into uh, Lie algebra such that uh, and you let translate it to uh, uh, you say that the, the distribution at the neutral element is d and the distribution of x is the left translate uh, uh, left translate of uh, okay and now uh, if uh, uh, if uh, D generates the algebra or should I say this uh, then uh, the X is an it's a it's a, a non completely non integrable distribution and uh, yet another example is uh, the one which is called the uh, in particular Carnot group I'm going to speak about this a Carnot group is uh, topologically uh, is topologically uh, an Rn uh, and we take exponential we identify it with the uh, the Lie algebra with the Lie group and we say that G is uh, V1 plus V2 plus Vm uh, so we have a direct decomposition uh, of G such that uh, VI, VJ, it is in uh, VI plus J. Uh, of course, if this uh, is greater than M, then, uh, then it's, uh, then it's uh, just zero. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, D1 generates 
uh, whole uh, G. Uh, then this is called the Carnot group. Uh, of course, the, the group is nilpotent. Uh, and the, but moreover, it has a property which is interesting is that we can define uh, for any scalar, positive scalar, we can define uh, a scalar multiplication, which is not exactly like the one. Uh, we are used with. So each each part of the direct decomposition is multiplied by epsilon at the power at the power. And uh, this is the structure of a Carnot group, and it gives a, a, a subriemannian manifold. Uh, or uh, you can find them in con in uh, control theory. Where uh, uh, under the name of non holonomic uh, mechanics, uh, where, uh, for example, uh, think about a car or just a wheel. Well, uh, okay, let's say you have a car uh, which uh, has wheels. Uh, and uh, you want to drive the car, and you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, take any part. But uh, if you look at the uh, space uh, of states of this car as a dynamical system, you'll see that uh, at any point in that space there is a subspace of possible directions uh, where the where the car can move and this forms a <clears throat> completely non-integrable distribution if and only if you can park the car uh, anywhere okay is it is it okay can i continue with my slides mm -hmm. yeah Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Hmm? Okay. Uh, now, I said that these spaces are weird. Uh, in the sense that they are fractals, their metric this dimension is bigger than the topological dimension. Um, they are not Alexandrov spaces, so they are not, except in Riemannian, so they are not uh, nice spaces from the point of view of on the point of view of Riemannian geometry. And uh, their tangent spaces, in the metric sense, there is a whole story about this, are Carnot groups, uh, not uh, vector spaces, because vector spaces are just commutative Carnot groups. They have only one uh, level. Uh, the Lie algebra is trivial, uh, and that's it. While uh, there are lots of Carnot groups which are non-commutative and tangent spaces uh, to such manifolds have a structure of, of non-commutative Carnot groups. For example, uh, the structure of the tangent space of a contact manifold uh, has a structure of a Heisenberg group, which is the simplest uh, non-commutative Carnot group. And they have uh, and they have a, a, a differential calculus which is based on this uh, multiplication by scalars, which are not the usual ones. Okay, 
but uh, they are very useful. For example, uh, exactly the same structure of uh, Carnot group you can find in another theorem by Gromov, uh, where he proves that uh, finitely generated groups of polynomial growth um, seen for, from very far away in the sense of gromov hausdorff distance. Uh, they are basically Carnot groups. And uh, this is another important result, which you can click on the slide and you go to the article. Uh, okay, they, he proved, uh, give, gave a very short proof of a very strong uh, result, Margulis muscle rigidity. Uh, simply by proving the Rademacher theorem for Carnot groups. I recall that the Rademacher theorem is the theorem which says that uh, Lipschitz function is derivable almost everywhere. Okay, and to have a Lipschitz function, you need a distance, and you have a distance. You need a measure, which is the Hausdorff. Uh, which is the house of measure given by that distance. So you can say almost everywhere and you need the notion of derivative. And for the notion of derivative, you have to use a non-commutative version of the usual derivative. And so once we prove the Rademacher theorem for Carnot groups, uh, which implies a very short proof for a very strong and difficult to prove result, Marcoulis muscle rigidity. And there are other, uh, uh, use this, for example, in computer science. Uh, uh, there's a counter example to conjecture uh, which uses the Heisenberg group as a Carnot group. And uh, 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 this is uh, another very intriguing result. Uh, there is a notion of approximate groups uh, which uh, was introduced. Uh, by, uh, I, I forgot who introduced it first, but it was studied essentially the structure of uh, these approximate groups uh, was described uh, by a logician, Bushovsky, and then by uh, uh, Breyer, Green, and Tao. And what they say is that essentially approximate groups uh, are pieces of Carnot group, if big enough. So it's very useful, but it's not well known. Okay, so what, what this has to do with, uh, with the subject of my talk is that uh, uh, I'm going to show you a simple structure which, uh, which can be used to simplify uh, many of the proofs of uh, resulting sublimanial geometry. So I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to, 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 to make drawings of, uh, say, trivial and graphs with the notes color, the two colors. And uh, this will be uh, the main operation. Uh, it, uh, you may think about E applied to A at scale epsilon or as the dilation based at A of scale epsilon applied to uh, uh, A. And this is its inverse. And the convention is that uh, these uh, nodes uh, have three ports uh, and uh, there is a natural uh, direction and uh, I, I think this, uh, this, this, this shows, uh, this shows the what is up and what is, the, what is the circular order of the port. And uh, this, this, this corresponds. Okay, now. Uh, emergent algebras, uh, I have a solution for, for the problem of Gromov. That is why I, uh, uh, I proposed emergent algebras. Uh, but then uh, the things moves to, moves to computation, as I shall explain. So what is an emergent algebra? You need, a, it's, a, uh, it's a combination uh, between algebra and topology. So you need a uniform space. Uh, namely a space which has a uniformity on itself so that you can say uh, things like uh, this co converges uniformly to that. 
and uh, there's a family of a family of idempotent right quasi groups. So we have a family of, of operation on the space indexed uh, by an element of a commutative group. Let's just think uh, that it is uh, zero infinity with multiplication. And they are idempotent. This operation are idempotent, and this is uh, Radomeister one. Well, it, it, you, you know why, but they, okay. And uh, they are right. They are they are right quasi groups. And this is Radomeister two. And moreover, the uh, the scale uh, you can compose the scales. That is, that means that it is an action of the commutative group on X, in the sense that uh, A uh, applies scale epsilon two, A applies scale mu to B, it's, uh, A applies scale epsilon mu to B. Okay, and this is the algebraic part, and there is the there is the topology or analysis part, and moreover, as epsilon goes to zero, some things some things converge uniformly to to something. Uh, the dilation based the dilation delta e epsilon applied to a converges to e. And there is this strange thing, which is called the approximate difference, which converges also uniformly with respect to, to ABC. So these are the axioms of emergent algebra. So it's a combination. It is not only uh, Radomeister uh, moves uh, and that all. Uh, there is this supplementary information that some uniform limits exist. Uh, and uh, by using them, uh, okay, this is the this is the the approximate difference in graphical form. So it's uh, a epsilon b, a epsilon c, and a and this epsilon inverse to this. You see, there is this uh, this other thing. Which I call approximate sum, which con which you can prove that it converges, and you have the approximate inverse, which you can prove that it converges by using the axiom. So if you if we stay in graphical form and with trivalent graphs, uh, that means that these three kinds of graphs are interesting. Okay, now. Uh, example examples of uh, of such emergent algebra. For example, in uh, Riemannian manifold, uh, where ex exponential is the geodesic the metric exponential, uh, you just take uh, the dilation of base at a applied to b at scale epsilon. You just take the logarithm of b. Uh, which is in the tangent space at A, you multiply it by epsilon and you go back, okay? And then you can prove, uh, this is one of the interpretation of the operation in the tangent space. You can prove that uh, that approximate difference converges to the difference of vectors in the tangent space at A. The sum converges to the sum of vectors in the tangent space of A and the inverse converges to what, one would expect uh, to the inverse uh, with respect to addition of vectors operation. Or uh, you can take a Lie group and uh, you see is this structure. Uh, you, you do the same thing, this time exponential logarithm R with respect to the group structure. And you take B, you go into the algebra, you multiply by epsilon and go back. And this, uh, you can prove that again, uh, that this difference uh, sum and inverse go where it is expected that they would go, namely to the difference of uh, uh, vectors in the tangent space of A, sum of vectors in the tangent space of A. And uh, that's interesting because this is, uh, this is a symmetric space structure, more, uh, more than, uh, than just the, the usual inverse. Okay, there. But you can take more interesting examples. So uh, compared to this, 
this is uh, look at Riemannian manifold. You have exponential, which is just an invertible function, which is inverse logarithm, and you multiply by a number. And then uh, if you use another dilation, this is the case of Stavrimania manifold. Uh, then what you get, you get in the limit, the operation is in a Carnot group. And uh, if you go to groups, this is what I showed you before. You just uh, do left translates of uh, of uh, dilation uh, in the tangent space and the identity, and these uh, and the, and those uh, approximate operations converge to what uh, one would expect. Only notice that in both cases uh, we are not uh, in general we are not in a commutative structure. Okay, so but what it is inter interesting is not that we can define the operation by uh, by uh, going to the limit. Is that you prove you can prove the properties of a, of an operation by going to the limit. So the properties of an operation th themselves are emergent in this sense. That's, that's why they are called uh, emergent algebra. For example, uh, the proof of the associativity of the sum operation, so this is sum based at A of B and C. It's only approximative, but then I'm going to pass to the limit if epsilon goes to zero. So if you want to prove that B plus C, say, or plus D is equal to B plus C plus D, then if we represent them as graph, there, there you recognize the sum. This is the sum. This is the second sum. This is the second sum. And this is the first sum. Okay. Now, if you look here, uh, we can apply a Rademeister to rewrite and to arrive to this graph. Uh, the other part looks a little bit more complicated. It's also two sums, but they are based in different places. One is based at A and the one is based in A epsilon B. So here is the first sum based at A. And here is the second sum based in AB. Again, we can apply a Rademeister to the right, and it gives the same thing. So you can pass from this here to there by or R2 and an inverse of a uh, usual R2. And then you go to the limit. And then the limit, you find that B plus C plus D in A is B plus C plus D also in A because this goes to A. You see, so you can prove associativity from such abstract nonsense and all the other properties. That's why uh, I was interested to know uh, what are the uh, what is the computational power of uh, of uh, such uh, things? So you have a graph we write on uh, practically on uh, on uh, decorated equivalent graphs. Uh, graph we write which are I mean it's only Rademeister one and Rademeister two in for trivalent graphs. And you can pass to the limit. That's all you can do. And, and what can you do with this? OK. Um, we can uh, as well use, uh, we can as well use uh, uh, decorated angles. Uh, so these are oriented. I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't put the. The orientation because it, uh, the figure gets uh, too heavy. So they are oriented tangled diagrams, which are simply graphs with four valent nodes with a node decorated with a, an element from the commutative group. And the uh, edges of the graph are decorated with the elements of elements of an emergent algebra. 
and the correspondence with the trivalent. So I think this is a fan out node. Uh, this is the dilation, and this is the inverse dilation. Okay, they don't have they don't have to be plan red graph. That means that we accept uh, uh, we accept the uh, intersection of the edges. They they don't mean anything. They are just graphs. Okay, so the approximate difference uh, in tangle form uh, can be put like this. It is this tangle. And uh, we know that as epsilon goes to zero, this tangle goes to a node with, uh, six, uh, with six elements and decorated with, uh, as, as it is here. And uh, the sum for the approximate sum is, is the mirror image of, uh, of uh, this angle. And we know from an uh, we know that when epsilon goes to zero, it goes to, to six. Okay. So now just let's look at, uh, at the thing which I, I call the Cora. Cora is, uh, means uh, space in Plato. Uh, and uh, what we have, we have a crossing decorated with a mu, which is, which is uh, surrounded by crossings decorated with an epsilon. So this crossing is inside the, the, the other, the, inside this. Okay, so at closer examination, so we want to know it, for example, what happens when epsilon goes to zero. And uh, we can notice that this is only by Radomaister Turi, right? It's equivalent with a difference, the crossing, and the sum. And so we know that we can pass to the limit with epsilon going to zero. We, we will have a limit. And I denote the limit like this. And if, if we look at the decorations, we see that it's exactly like in the example I showed you with a, with a group. There is an operation which has E as neutral element. It's an operation almost as one of a Carnot. It has all the algebraic properties of a Carnot group as a group, and it's called a conical group. And it, it has exactly the form A plus scalar multiplication applied to minus A plus B. And even if this crossing do not have, so for this crossing, we do not have the Radomaister tree rewrite available. For this one, we can prove that we have. In this sense, the Radomaister tree rewrite emerges, emerges from the Radomaister one and two, and that uniform, uniform and that existence of uniform limit. So it's not that Radomaister tree is a consequence of R1 and R2 because that would be stupid. It's a consequence of R1 and R2 and some existence of some uniform limit. It emerges from R1 and R2. R2 and it, it applies not for the original crossings, but for this, let's say I call this infinitesimal crossing. Okay. So uh, what, is a, what is a conical group? A conical group is, is what you would expect. Uh, so this is the group operation and you have multiplication by scholars, uh, which, is, uh, which distributes over the operation of the group. And it also has the property that A, B applied to X plus Y, it's A, B, it's A applied to B applied to X, okay? And these are uh, uniformly constructive uh, with respect to the parameter, uh, to, 
to the scala. These are uh, Carnot groups are particular example of conical groups, and there is a structure theorem by uh, Zeber, uh, who says that if uh, uh, that if uh, such a group has some supplementary topological properties, then we can prove that it is a Carnot group. Uh, okay, this is a slide with examples of, of, just that, uh, of such uh, conical groups. I draw it on paper before. So you have any vector space. It's, uh, it's a commutative conical group, a Heisenberg group. Uh, Heisenberg group. You take a Hilbert space <coughs> and you do the, uh, you do the, how would you tell you? You pass to the contact version. You you add a, an R and you invent the operation uh, x u uh, plus y v is x plus y and here is u plus v plus a half of the uh, imaginary part of the of the product uh, x y or if you want this is just this is just the 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 the, 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 the standard simple form on age uh, okay and the distribution is from left, left translates of the uh, Hilbert space and the multiplication by scalars you can take here a scalars uh, complex number except in zero and you multiply the elements of the Hilbert space uh, as usual but you multiply with a non square the elements of phi. Okay, now let's go back to, to the Radomeister free rewrite. So the Radomeister free rewrite which emerges is uh, is this. So uh, uh, dilation decorated lambda in mu go to this. This passes uh, uh, over this one. And you can prove it only by emergent. Uh, uh, you can prove it that it's emergent. Uh, it, the proof is uh, is not too short. But uh, what what does it mean? Okay, so let's see. Let's measure the uh, this angle measures the uh, difference from uh, from the Radomeister free rewrite uh, because. Uh, this is the this is the mirror of this and this is this okay so now it's easy to if you follow the lines it's easy to see that if you start with c you end with c if you start with b goes under a lambda crossing and again oh, 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 under an opposite lambda crossing so by an r2 you get b but A, uh, in principle, goes to something which is, has, a, has a complex form if you try to express it. And uh, the Radomeister tree rewrite holds if and only if this R is equal to A. Uh, now, uh, if we don't, uh, if we use this angle, but before passing to the limit, namely, you will also have a parameter epsilon here, the same for for all this. So he says if we put in a if we put in a cora, as I as I said previously, of base at a of and scale s and scale epsilon, this angle which measure, measures the difference from uh, the Radomeister tree right? What do we get? And uh, I argue that we get a good notion of curvature, which is more general than the one uh, than the one uh, for Riemannian manifolds. Okay. First of all, this R, this this curvature is zero if and only if the Radomeister tree rewrite rewrite is true, but 
the Radha treaty right is true if and only if uh, these are dilations in a Carnot group, in a conical group, well, in particular in a Carnot group. And uh, that means uh, R is A for every A, B, C, if and only if we are in a flat space because are no for conical groups are non commutative versions are are non are, are in a sense tangent spaces so they should be flat but they are non commutative so they are non commutative versions of flat spaces so r is zero r is a excuse me if and only if uh, we are in a flat space otherwise if we examine what happens uh, in general uh and if we start with a uh, metric space xd and with uh, approximate dilations then we see that uh, what r is what r controls is the following so we do we do some rescalings now imagine x uh, is the is the real world and uh, any rescaling that is uh, any pre-image of a dilation uh, gives you a map. So uh, let's make the map which is based at E and has the scale epsilon. And on this map, the points B and C appear at delta epsilon A and delta epsilon AB. Now, so you have a map of the real world and now you have, you have uh, two points in the real world. They are on your map and now you treat the map as if it is the real world and you rescale it again with respect to C and scale lambda fixed, epsilon will go to zero, and you have a map of a map, and you compare the map with the map of the map. That means you rescale at B, a scale mu, but in the first map, or you rescale at the same scale in the second map. And you want to see what happens with the Gromov, with the distance as metric space, with the Gromov holds the distance between these rescalings as epsilon go to zero. If you compute this for uh, Riemannian manifolds, then you get something which is not the Riemannian curvature and is not a sectional curvature, but it is something which combines this. So it is something which combines sectional curvature, say. So <clears throat> the distance between uh, A and R any upper bound of the distance between A, A and R gives you an upper bound of the gram of Hausdorff's distance between rescaling. And this is the meaning of the curvature, which for me works all, uh, it's also good in sublimanian spaces where there is no notion of curvature. Okay, so, so Radomeister 3, the de deviation from Radomeister 3 in general gives you a good notion of carbon. Okay. Now, uh, uh, if we want to see when these uh, emergent operations are commutative, then uh, we can prove that there is a uh, we can prove that there is a condition. Uh, which I call the shuffle trick. Maybe it's good if I pass to. Maybe it's good if I pass to. Uh, to the paper. Okay. So what is the shuffle trick? So the shuffle trick is the following. I have a, a dilation. Uh, of coefficient epsilon, delta epsilon, delta mu, a, b, 
So I have this delta epsilon based in delta mu a b apply delta mu c d. The shuffle trick says that uh, uh, this is equal to the same structure, but where epsilon and mu change places. And uh, A and D stay the same, but uh, B and C uh, change places. Or uh, if you want, in uh, graphical form, is that if you have a dilation of coefficient epsilon, mm, mm, Uh, you can uh, rewrite it into uh, epsilon, but but this time they but you have to exchange this thing and. Uh, in algebraic, in pure algebraic terms, says that it says that uh, uh, a mu b epsilon c mu b is equal to a epsilon c mu the epsilon only. So B and C change places and epsilon mu change change places. So the the, the the result says that if an emergent algebra has this property, then uh, it is uh, it's more than that. Okay, it it has the form. Uh, where all this all this structure can reconstruct. It it, it is uh, it is uh, the one from from a vector space, and uh, the, it it is an equation. Okay, so this is the shuffle thing, and that's when uh, you have commutativity. So let me let, let me rephrase a little bit what uh, what I what I said. I said that uh, I said that R three emerges from uh, R one R to plus uh, uniformity plus uniformity assumptions and uh, the original uh, operation uh, name is the and the and in the limit we get uh, we get uh, uh, R three. It's equivalent with um, uh, with this. Uh, meaning that uh, you have something which is called the quantum. And quantals are used to, to decorate node diagrams. And from this point of view, quantals are linear because they are just structures of Tangent spaces, they are linear but non commutative. Now, the second thing I said that if you have this equality, 
then not only that you get a linear structure or the uh, uh, an Alexander Quandle, but you get you not only that you get a linear structure, you get a commutative structure. So in this sense, no diagrams can be used for linear computations. And moreover, uh, this can be used for linear and commutative computation. And what sort of computations? Computations related to logic. And uh, I'm going to explain this. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so that commutativity is equivalent to the following apparently strange thing. Uh, so, the shuffle trick is equivalent to the fact that, okay, so this is the dilation node, and uh, we know this fourth one with from with second one with C and the third chord with S. Okay, so now what happens if we permute the chords? Do we get a dilation? In the commutative case, it is true, but in general, it is not true. And it is, if we can, so there are six permutations. If all these six permutations of the chords are also dilations, then the operation is commutative. I think okay. now uh, this can be used to prove the lambda calculus uh, emerges uh, in the sense I explained. So I recall what is lambda calculus. Uh, it's uh, it's one of the two pillars of computation uh, along with the Turing uh, machine. It is the prototype type of the of a programming language if you want it has only two oper it has uh, it is a it is a term rewrite system it has uh, you can use variables and you can apply a term to another term this is an operation it is called application and uh, you can apply this is you okay so you you may think about this as the function a which depends on x although it's not exactly true but you can form abstractions like this lambda xa and it has only one rewrite rule which says that if you apply lambda xd to b then it changes into d where all occurrences of x in d were replaced were replaced by d it is as simple, but it is as powerful as the Turing machine. So any computation can be done in this. Okay. And it has a graphical version. If you pass to the abstract uh, syntax tree, and you denote by a green node the, appli uh, the, the application and by a red node the abstraction. So what we have, there is a term D where X possibly enters into the composition of D. This is the output of D, and this is the abstraction node, which has X from lambda X, and here goes lambda X point D, and which is applied to B. And uh, beta reduction says that you have to delete these two nodes and connect beta X and D to, to the, upper side of the graph. So you just replace these two nodes by a, by a crossing. So this is the, the graphical form of the beta, beta rewrite. Now, uh, what I uh, can prove, but uh, well, uh, you, you go, go, go to Go to pure C to for more. 
uh, is that uh, we can decorate uh, uh, or emergent algebras which are commutative, namely which uh, we satisfy the shuffle trick, can be used to decorate graphs of lambda terms as such that the beta rewrite appears as a graph rewrite which is emergent as uh, Rademeister tree was uh, previously. And this uh, beta, uh, the beta right emerges from the shuffle tree. The application uh, is this, and the abstraction is this. And uh, let me explain how, how it emerges. So ignore, ignore the, this, uh, these are notations from something which is called Chem Lambda. If you go to pure C, you'll see, but uh, look at this as, as a usual violation node. So this, is, so this is the shuffle. The shuffle from epsilon changes with mu, you see? And uh, uh, B, B changes with mu. So this is the usual shuffle. But now, if we pass with mu to infinity, uh, then we get this. This is uh, this means uh, uh, this is the arrow element element invented by Louis Kaufman in our collaboration on Chen Lambda. Uh, it means uh, just reconnect, uh, just reconnect the other. So, if we if we take the left hand side of this. Or this should be blue. Also. Then it goes to this, and this is the two-node configuration, like in the beta rewrite, where you have B, C, A, D. If we pass the limit here, these two nodes will disappear, and you will have this time A with D connected, so it corresponds to A with D connected and B with C connected. So it is exactly the beta rewrite. Now, uh, with the rules, uh, with the rules for decoration from this is exactly the beta rewrite. So this is the abstraction node. This is the application node, and this is the node which I call the flow. Uh, initially, was the external panel. Never mind. It's from it's from another formal here now. But you can see that it is exactly the beta rewrite. So in this sense, the beta rewrite emerges from commutative. Uh, emergent algebras. So, in conclusion, uh, in general, emergent algebras and their graph rewriting version seem to be very, very general. If we take in particular emergent algebras which are, which are linear, then we can use them to decorate not diagrams. They are quant, they form quantals. And they can use be they can be used to decorate not diagrams, but not diagrams. Therefore, in terms of emergent algebra, correspond to linear computation. If moreover, if we moreover we have the shuffle trick, that is, if we are in a in a linear and commutative emergent algebra, then we can do logic. So in this sense, they correspond to lambda calculus computation. And uh, uh, that was uh, the subject of my talk. So most general is, I don't know how to call it, the analysis. The, when you linearize analysis, you go to not theory. And if you make not theory commutative in a sense, then you get lambda calculus that was that was what i wanted to show you thank you okay thank you very much please questions comments uh yeah um uh, uh from the point of view of uh alexander quandle uh, uh you are labeling the knot diagrams with Alexander Quandles for different um, 
values of epsilon. So yes. what we often do in knot theory, except perhaps in the case of, of a link with many components where different values of the epsilon would happen there, um, we usually are labeling with uh, out of one quandle, right? Um, yeah. And um, and so I think you're saying that from the point of view of computation, it makes a lot of sense to have it labeled with a multiplicity of epsilons and multiplicity of those variables. And it may be interesting to understand what kind of things happen in the knot diagrams if you label with a multiplicity of local quandals in that way. Yeah, uh, it is, uh, 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 okay, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pass to the, oh, no, I'll pass to the camera, but uh, my, uh, I stopped sharing, okay. But excuse me, I don't, I don't know if it's still visible because my camera fell off <laughs> during the talk. If, yeah. uh, if I write here, it is, is it visible for you? Yeah, we see your... Clear? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, indeed, uh, for example, um, uh, if I take this, what I call the Quora. Uh, and I take a crossing. And I decorate this with epsilon here and with mu here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the kind of uh, tangle diagram which is decorated with uh, well, they are not, okay, so I'm not allowed to use the R3, okay? So otherwise they would be quandles. Okay, uh, this formally, of course you can think, uh, you can uh, join this with this and you get, you would get uh, something. Uh, this formally is a crossing. Only that it has some uh, it has some parameters dangling uh, on it, but otherwise it's a crossing. So what crossing is this uh, from another point of view? Uh, what I argue is that uh, is that the following. So this is like a okay. So this is like a, the image of a microscope. So you look at a space of labels from the quandal, you look at, you put your microscope at E and you rescale, you use the microscope to look what happens at the scale epsilon. Mm -hmm. And at the scale epsilon, all things like crossings in particular, we look like this, for example, all crossings will look like these crossings, all crossings decorations. If that would be a, uh, if, uh, if, if I would, if I would be in a metric space, that means that I would look at, when I put this microscope, I will look at the distance one over epsilon d, uh, is this one? So instead of using dxy, I would use this distance instead of using yeah. this. You see? But so if you if you use different values, mu and epsilon, then you may yeah. find that you have isolated certain parts of the diagram that uh, will not be slipped over by other parts of the diagram because there are no Reitermeister moves available between an epsilon and a mu necessarily. Yeah, there are, uh, there so, is more, uh, you, so that you, may be of interest in the sense that you wish to isolate some part of the diagram and not have it slide over another part. Yeah, so you can. You, uh, so, but the uh, other you, side is what what computational advantage is there to having this? Perhaps quite a lot if you're is, is, thinking is of building that, computations using these. 
uh, is that uh, uh, okay? So you can, if you if you can slide this uh, out, that means that your space is scale invariant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, another comment about quandals. Yeah. Uh, um, two comments really. Um, uh, one is that there is a generalized notion called a biquandal, which may be of interest to you in this context, because then if you think of a node in a knot diagram, I mean a crossing, uh, and you have two labels on the incoming lines, then you will get two different labels on the outcoming lines. It won't be in this, in the quandal, the, uh, the overline is constantly labeled. But in the biquandal, you have two outputs, two functions of two variables, and you then approach from the set theoretic side solutions to the Yang Baxter equation and many uh, relationships that may actually feed back into the geometry that you're looking at, quite possibly. Yeah, okay, so I should yeah. talk to you, I should talk to you about biquandals. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you more. Uh, the uh, other, yeah. Wait, 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 wait a moment, please, because uh, uh, if uh, yeah, the, uh, I I want to to see this, but recall, uh, I want to point you. Maybe I I think you, there may be a connection with uh, La Font uh, with La Font uh, interaction combinators. Oh. Let me find. Uh, because in Lafont interaction combinators, in a moment, I'll find. <laughs> uh, in Lafont, in, no, uh, no, uh, yeah, okay. In Lafont interaction combinators, uh, there are two nodes, gamma and delta, which correspond. Each node can be expressed as a combination of two nodes. Which can be expressed with dilations. Mm -hmm. You see, so I have not uh, went into this direction, but my intuition tells me that maybe the bicondal idea may apply here. You mm -hmm. see, uh, maybe I okay. I, I'm I'm eager to talk about that. But I don't know. Maybe, uh, uh, I, I, I would may, maybe maybe there are biquandals related to interaction combinators. Yeah, you see so, here. I don't know whether you can see what I hold up. Do you see what I hold up? Uh, yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah. I'm sure you do. Yes, I do. But this is what I'm saying that uh, the biquandal structure has two inputs and two outputs, each of which yeah. is a function of the two inputs. Yeah. quite natural from the point of view of gates and logic and circuits but yeah. it came a little late in the knot theory because while we know how to work with these things we don't have a good homotopy theoretic uh understanding of what they are so that's one of the reasons why uh, we're lagging on them a little bit but uh, there are good reasons for studying them and there's a lot about them actually so yeah. they may occur in your situation. I wouldn't be surprised if, if they did, or you know. may want to use them. Yeah, yeah, you are right. But uh, uh, I, 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 I think I tried some some time ago, and I, I mean, I didn't get anywhere. But maybe oh. now. It's <laughs> always good to try again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the other the other point I wanted to make is of abstract point. Um, knot theorists talk about the quandal of a knot or a link. And what they yeah. mean by that, of course, is that you have the axioms for the quandal, you put down arbitrary labels on the quandal, but you demand uh, that they, are, they satisfy the relations that happen at the crossings, all the different crossings. So you get an algebraic system with generators and relations, and that algebraic system will be an invariant of the knot or link. Um, and then, of course, one looks for representations. And upon looking for representations, the labelings begin to occur. But that's the general algebraic context that yeah. knot theorists work with. 
and um, that same notion of having a, an algebra associated to a network as a whole may be useful here. Uh, yeah, I have, I, I have, I have a question uh, which I don't know how to solve. So uh, you see, uh, these emergent algebras are not uh, even in the linear case. In the linear, I, I mean, with the Radomeyer tree, they are like a family of quantiles parameterized by a by by a scalar such that when the scalar goes to zero the quantile operation deforms to something mm. you see okay so now my question which i don't know how to answer but it seems to me as uh, as, as interesting is the following uh, i take a knot uh, this gives me a quantum now how can I associate to the knot not the quantal but the quantal and the deformation to something? You see, how can I associate to the knot not only the quantal of the knot but also a deformation of it? What do you mean by deformation? Uh, but for example, uh, if I if I think in the other way around, suppose I have a, uh, I have suppose I have a group uh, which has these uh, approximate dilations on it, okay, and I want to reconstruct the structure of the group from the information coming from the dilation. That means if I if I pass this to not diagram drawings, that means that each uh, equation from the group would translate into a tangle diagram. And so the real question which I'm asking is what kind of knots can be decorated with the element from my family of, for example. How, uh, uh, yeah, well, of I, course, I, that, that one, I, I'm just looking for correspondences. That question, of course, is one that we confront. We may have a quandle in front of us, perhaps the three element quandle, a good yeah, example. Exactly. Simple little three element quandle. And we can ask what knots can be labeled with that quandle. Well, in fact, it's an algebraic problem that's not so hard to answer. Um, but in general, that, that can be a question. I have a quandle. I want to know what knots can be labeled with that quandle. And um, in general, I wouldn't know how to answer the question. Yeah, so the, uh, for me, it's like uh, I, have a, uh, I have a cardinal group. And uh, I know that it is nilpotent. So uh, that means uh, that uh, Okay, I know that it's finitely generated uh, because it is nilpotent. I know that it can be given by general tests and relations, but I know uh, a little bit more about this. I have these dilations on it. So I have these quandles, this one parameter, uh, one parameter family of quandles. How can I say in terms of uh, not diagrams that, for example, that uh, uh, it's a Heisenberg group? You see, it, uh, it can be, or it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it has, uh, it has this structure uh, of nilpotent group with uh, three levels, say, or things like this. All this can be expressed uh, equivalently in uh, find the, find the knots, yeah. find the, find the tangle diagrams. It can be decorated uh, with. Uh, with elements from the group, uh, or the inverse. If I take a knot, uh, if I take the trefoil knot, with three, which can be colored, colored with three colors, uh, what? Uh, and if I can associate it to this bundle, a deformation, uh, what uh, Carnot group? 
does this uh, describe? Uh, well, it seems to me that you're you're in the perennial sort of situation where you have a, a, kind of a particular kind of structure and then you're wondering if that structure is part of some larger context. And, and of course, we don't know how to solve problems like that, but we, we get inspired by them and sometimes we can do it, right? Sometimes you can shift something that seems quite particular into a larger and more general context. But you have, a, you have some very specific more general contexts here, so maybe solutions arise for you. Yeah, no. The the, the thing is that is the the thing is that this uh, uh, this uh, context is uh, is in fact uh, uh, very general. For uh, for example, formally, uh, I don't know. There, there are results from logic which says that which say so. Logic. Whenever you use logic, uh, you you end up with uh, uh, countable structures. You see, you don't end up with uh, you don't end up with uncountable structures. Usually, you end up with countable structures because you can express them by formulae, which are there's a countable number of them. You're talking about there always are countable models. No, I'm talking about that if you can describe uh, something with logic formulae, uh, then uh, because the number of logic formulae is, uh, count, is uh, it's countable, then you, you mean uh, there is a uh, well, there is well, a, there is a I think, famous I think you're, I think you are talking about the Skolem theorem. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah, yeah that so, that whenever uh, you have a formal system. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It has countable models, and uh, sometimes one uses that to to decompress from the fantasies about the infinite. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, uh, well, by uh, by using, uh, uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, by using uh, only uh, uh, this abstract nonsense. Then uh, you can do you can uh, describe um, differential calculus and analysis things in uh, in uh, but in a countable way. For example, you can say that uh, uh, you uh, for example, if I want to make uh, a countable model of a uh, vector space. Of course, I, I know that there are finite, there is finite vector spaces, but I want uh, to make, I know that there exist countable well, vector it, spaces. Uh, it it, it depends, on, depends on your field. You could, uh, you could choose a, a, a constructivist model of the real numbers that's fundamentally countable, only algorithmic real numbers, yeah. something okay, like so that. Okay, so related to this kind of, this kind of things, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I can say that uh, my world is made of uh, trees uh, with uh, nodes of two colors uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so my world is, is made of trees with the uh, with the leaves decorated uh, from a set of variables and i say that uh, this so this is a tree and i can say very quickly that uh, two trees are equivalent uh, if uh, this Uh, okay, so I can, okay. Uh, I can say that a tree is finite uh, if it's generated uh, by the following trees, by this, by the, by the trees that I showed as uh, dilation, uh, difference, and sum. And uh, this. If you generate it by this,
if we generate it by this is finite. The two finite fees are equivalent if this is finite. Then you can prove without going to anywhere else, you can prove that well, what is the intuition of this? If these trees were points in a space, uh, this is the inverse dilation base at this point applied to this. And uh, if these two are not equal, then this goes away when the parameters go to zero. So you say that these two are these two finite trees are equivalent if they correspond to the same point. This is the intuition behind it. Mm -hmm. And this is an this is an equivalence relation. And uh, this gives the set of points. In a space, it's a it's it's a it's a it's a countable uh, a countable number of points, and this gives you the set of points in a space which corresponds to algebraically to an object which could be called a free uh, emergent algebra. You see, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a countable number of them, and you can continue with uh, saying, for example, what is the derivative of a function from the equivalence classes of finite trees from point to point and so on and so forth. You can express all the uh, whatever you want in terms of differential calculus. You can express them on this model. And I don't know what it means because it's countable. It's very elementary. It is countable. And I don't, I, okay, by Scholem theorem, it should be one of those countable models of Tom's logic. But this is so uh, concrete that I don't know what it means. I know that it, uh, and, uh, and there are, you, you, you can develop this in the, in the directions of group theory. <clears throat> you can probably can prove the, uh, you can uh, give a sort of solution to Hilbert's fifth problem uh, in terms of this. And I don't understand how come that I can do all the computations I need, but this is obviously a, not a continuous but a countable model. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Did, did did you write down this model somewhere? I could I would like to look uh, at I it. Can, I, I could do I I could I could send you. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm uh, hogging all the questions. There may be other questions. Yeah. Yes. Another question. Yes. It seems no questions, so maybe we can stop our discussion. I, 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 I don't hear you well. I yes. Think he's suggesting if there are no further questions, we can adjourn at this point. Uh, thank you very much from my end. That's been very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is this has more. to be the uh, earliest uh, lecture I've ever gone to. Um, it's it's three twenty three in the morning <laughs> here in Chicago. <laughs> For me, it's very early also because I I uh, my my sleep due to the quarantine my sleep program uh, moved to I'm going to sleep at six in the morning, so this time I have to to wake up at uh, something like 7.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this is very early for <laughs> Yes, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you very much for everybody. And we will meet next week. And next week's speaker will be David Sanders from Florida State University. And you will get emails from Nikolai about exact time. Yes, right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. See you next week. <laughs> See you.